We are back, Penn State football fans. Blue White breakdown, early August, Tuesday, August 8th. Johnny McGonigal, Bob Flounders. Johnny, we were up in State College. Kind of a weird, it was on a Sunday, not a Saturday. That it, I, it, I thought it was Saturday all, all day long. I had to keep reminding myself for the stories that it was actually on a Sunday. But uh, got to meet up with James, his coordinators, all three prominent coordinators. Uh, all of the Penn State players, save for the uh, true freshmen, I think were largely made available. Always an interesting day. There was a practice availability um, afterward. I think they got rained on a little bit. But, Johnny, uh, there's a lot to talk about as far as uh, kind of James's thoughts, but also some player thoughts, some coordinator thoughts. And, yes, we're, we're, in, we're well inside of a month uh, until Penn State opens its season against those pesky West Virginia Mountaineers at home on September 2nd. Uh, I know you enjoyed you enjoyed Media Day as much as I did. Good to see you once again. What were some of the things, would you say, really stood out to you, whether it was James or something his coordinator said, or even something some of the players said? Yeah, there was a lot to, to take from it because, you know, we get there at, you know, we, we roll up at, what, 1130 or so, James – uh, pulls in to talk around 12.15, um, and then the coordinators follow him uh, in the Beaver Stadium media room. And then after that, just to you know, bring the readers and listeners you know, behind the curtain a little bit, we all kind of filter out to the field at Beaver Stadium. All the players are separated by position, uh, and, and basically we have an hour. We have an hour to, to bop around to as many yeah. people uh, as we can. Uh, you know, we, everyone has their own different agendas and different uh, different things they need to check off their their list. Players they need to talk to, coaches they need to talk to, uh, whether it's for stories down the line. Mm-hmm. Um, I know I'm working on a couple of things I need to talk to, you know, guys for you know a couple of weeks down the line. But then you also, you know, just have the stuff you want to write for this week and um, and plenty to write about uh, for sure. And uh, just a couple of things that stood out from James's press conference, and we can get deeper into it, but. You know, I asked them about one of the newsier things, you know, nationally and within the Big Ten mm-hmm. uh, is that Oregon and Washington joining um, in 2024 alongside UCLA and USC. And that brings the Big Ten, you know, to 18 teams. And it's a different Big Ten yeah. than what James Franklin joined uh, 10 years ago. And I asked him about those two schools joining. And uh, I remember, you know, a year ago, when USC and UCLA joined, he put out a statement saying, you know, we embrace the change and they're two great institutions. And um, he wasn't as like, he wasn't as gung ho about it this time around. Um, I don't know if he just didn't have his coffee yet, or maybe he needed another one for what <laughs> promised to be a long day. But no, he, he said that, you know, he felt that like he was somewhat sad with the way the college athletics has kind of gone. Um, and you know, the, the, underlying current there being like the death of the PAC 12, essentially, um, uh, with, with those moves and Arizona, Arizona state, Utah moving to the big 12. Um, but he also said that, uh, you know, this, this is something that, you know, their strategy behind all of this and, and in the big 10 sense, their strategy in bringing in these teams and, and becoming, and, and it really not, not even becoming, but further establishing yourself as one of two. Uh, major players, major conferences alongside the SEC. And so it was interesting to hear James talk about that. And then just some position battles. Didn't name a quarterback. Uh, mm-hmm. We're not expecting that, uh, you know, tomorrow or anything. You know, that's that's going to be something that they'll drag out for for a little bit here. Um, but just, you know, hear him talking about the wide receivers and, uh, and you know, the D tackles and some other position groups that we're interested in uh, going into camp. He mentioned – you know, Jackson Smollick, the freshman quarterback, being the surprise of camp so far. Emphasis on the so far because it's only been a few practices. But, um, you know, interesting to hear a true freshman quarterback get a shout out like that from Franklin mm-hmm. when all the focus is on Drew and Bo. Um, yeah, a lot to take from James. And I'm sure I'm sure you had some takeaways, too. I know you had some takeaways. You wrote about takeaways mm-hmm. after, after James. James is a clever guy. He's always Johnny. I, my, my, my thoughts on Jackson Smollick is he he may very well be. Uh, I'm impressing uh, the coaching staff and his teammates and all of that may be true, but James is a clever guy. He's always got the transfer portal on his mind. And uh, if you're going to give somebody a shout out, I think, I think it's it never hurts to give a quarterback that really is barring, barring some injuries is not expected to play. If if they like him a little bit, it it never hurts to give a guy like that 
a shout out because the the transfer portal is uh is very real. But one of the things that struck me as we were it wasn't some I didn't think maybe the coaches I, uh, Manny Diaz is always, I think, a guy that, you know, you, you, you ask him a question, he's going to give you an honest answer. And I always appreciate that about Manny. I don't know that there was much to be to be gleaned from either Mike Yurcich's or James's, um, you know, news conferences. They were James spoke, spoke for 30 minutes. I think Mike spoke for 10. Um, it, I don't think it was necessarily big news, but uh, they, won't, they won't have Smith Vilbert this year at defensive end. I know you wrote something about that. I think Audrey Snyder had that first and Penn State confirmed it. I, I don't know how big of a loss, honestly, that really is. But one of the things that struck me, Johnny, is when it came time to go out on the field and talk to the players, most years, most years when it's time to talk to the players, I think there's all, there's two or three must-talk-to guys on the team. The, the elite players that everyone's got, ta- everyone's got, you know, preseason stories to do, tab cover stories to do, and, and you could pretty much – you pretty much know who who are going to be the hot commodities, and there's going to there's just going to be a long line of uh, of reporters around those players. This year, Penn State is so deep. I mean, I think there you can make a case there are about fifteen lions. I think that were you know I, I thought it was a lot easier to kind of make the rounds a little bit. I know Nick Singleton uh, was going to be busy on Sunday, and I, I think obviously Drew Aller is a guy that's going to be busy, but. You look at the offensive line, you look at Olu Fashanu, right? You look at the defensive end room, and there's three guys. It's Chop, Adisa, Deny, Dennis Sutton. You look at the secondary with Kalen King and Johnny Dixon. Uh, the safety room, even though there's not a lot of known names yet, I think I think it's pretty clear watching them. They have two or three really talented safeties, and at least one of them is going to emerge. The wide receiver room. I think with Dante Cephas in the fold, he was a guy that people wanted to talk to along with Keandre Lambert-Smith, Katron Allen. There was just so many, the tight ends, Theo, you know, Tyler Warren, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really, I think uh, it speaks to just how well constructed this team could be for, uh, for 2023. And I, I thought it was interesting. I, I'm really interested. I, you know, I wonder, I just wonder the guys that we talked to on Sunday, um, did we miss any, or were there some that are going to sneak under the radar and by October, like last year, whether it was Abdul Carter, uh, somebody like that, who we couldn't have talked to last year, but there's going to be some guys we probably didn't get to that are going to be really, really, you know, important players on this team. Uh, this team, there's no question in my mind that in terms of talent, if they're healthy, this is his most talented team. The 2016 uh, team was, was the big 10 champion. And they had some some marquee names as well. But as far when you talk about well rounded and you talk about depth, the 2017 team was right there too. I just think this team has a chance to be the most talented team. They still have to live up to that. They're going to have to beat. They're going to have to figure out a way to beat Michigan, uh, Ohio State, maybe both of them. And if they can do that, but I do think the talent's there. And I, I really did get a a kick out of uh, out of some of those players. I wanted to ask you one thing though. It might seem small. So the the, the early coaches poll uh, came out on Monday. Preseason coaches poll, top 25. Johnny, no surprise, Georgia at the top. Michigan, two. Ohio State, four. Penn State, seven. I know you have a vote in the AP poll in season. The one only thing that stood out to me is, I, why do people consistently, uh, what's with the love affair with USC? I mean, I, I, they they are a team that, other than having a pretty good offense, I mean, they still got to do some things on defense. I, I just thought Penn State should have been number six at the very least. I didn't think I would never put USC ahead of a Penn State team just because I don't think they play any defense. What did you think about the early poll? And do you think Penn State is worthy of number seven? So, look, I'll, I'll put it this way. So my my AP vote preseason poll, yeah. I submitted that last week. Okay. Uh, I believe that comes out on the 14th. Um, I'm going to have a story that that will come out either the day before or the day after those that poll drops, mm-hmm. you know, with my entire poll and explain Good. why. And uh, and let's just say I have Penn State higher than seven. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave it that. there. I'll leave it there. Um, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to it. I, I think that's <clears throat> I'm reading between the lines and I'm thinking maybe you might even have them higher than sixth. And what I like about you, Johnny, is you you have a reason for everything you do. And I'm looking forward to reading that story. But 
I, I do think they are better than the number seven team in the country. I definitely would not put USC in front of them, but it is what it is. I think LSU's in front of them as well. Alabama obviously is there, but yeah, um, Penn Look, State's going to have to earn their way, and the preseason polls mean very little. Um, but looking at this team, the way it finished last year, the talent that it has, I know there were some key losses, but um, I think this is going to be a very interesting year. I know the fans are excited for West Virginia, um, but yeah, it's uh, – I think that Penn State really has – it's all in front of them, Johnny. I think if they continue to develop and they're, de- and they're as deep as they think they are, they're just going to be a tough matchup for, for, just, for everyone on the schedule, Michigan and Ohio State included, but they still got to win those games. James is, I think, 1-8 against Ohio State. I think he's 3-6 and six against Michigan. There were some close losses, but close doesn't count. They needed to win some of those games. And uh, once they start winning them, <clears throat> the recruiting is going to get even better and better. So it's exciting. Johnny, um, if you had to guess, uh, if, is, there, is there a day or is there a date in August on your calendar where you think that James will finally make the decision on the starting quarterback? I know it's probably not very relevant, but in terms of how, wait, how long he's going to wait, I would imagine – I mean, to me, I, I think it's going to go past the halfway point of August. I would think it's going to come, you know, end of the third week. I don't know if I'll wait to game week, but I would think maybe the week before game week would be there. There would be some news. How about you? Yeah, I think it would be the week before. Um, and we've already seen or like you know heard like little snippets of like oh Drew Aller being filmed for like you know promo material uh, <laughs> for NBC and and all all these kind of things. So like. We know where this is going, um, but, it, you know, it was interesting because, you know, going back to media day and the hour that we have out on the field and that hour goes fast, especially really like, does. Uh, with with the number of, of players that are are worth talking to on this team. So when we first walk out and and Drew is walking out like first, I'm like, you know, what? I'm just going to get to him now yeah. uh, because God knows how big that that crowd yeah. is going to be later on. And it was like me and maybe four or five other people. And so I was able to get in my questions to him early. And one of them was just, you know, ahead of this competition and the situation that he finds himself in. And, you know, 99% sure he's going to be the the starter unless something bad happens here in the next few weeks that I asked him kind of, what did you learn about yourself uh, last year playing in those 10 games? Uh, you know, learning from Sean Clifford, everything that went into the last 12 months for him. And he just said, you know, just learning to just be yourself and, and take everything as it comes. Uh, let the game come to you. And it's interesting, too, because he's kind of taking that same approach to leadership at this point. You know, he mentioned older players on the offense being more vocal, uh, like an Olu or even like a Keandre Lambert Smith, uh, Theo Johnson, Hunter Norzad, who Dave, mm-hmm. you know, Dave Jones wrote an interesting column about. Uh, Hunter in the center position, if you haven't checked that out. Um, But he said that, look, I'm kind of just picking my spots right now. And that's fair, you know, given that we're just getting started into into training camp. I wouldn't be surprised, though, over the next few weeks to see him grow into that, you know, more of a leadership role, into his voice a little bit more. He's going to have to. Um, he he laughed when I asked him, you know, do you have that Sean Clifford voice yet? And he said, maybe not now, but I have it in me essentially. And, uh, I think we're going to see that. And and I'm sure the coaches and the team and his teammates will see that over the next few weeks. And, um, so yeah, I, I, I would think the week before the season or maybe we can have two weeks before the season, Mm -hmm. Uh, is when James will announce that. But look, I mean, Bo Perbul is going to have a role on this team. Uh, you know, it was alluded to or mentioned in the spring, maybe maybe yeah. some sub packages for him. Uh, they definitely want to get him some experience late in games, uh, kind of similar to what they did with Drew last year, because they know from a couple years ago at Iowa, um, you know, the, the value of having a prepared backup, uh, you know, if something happens to your starting mm-hmm. quarterback. And so, um, you know, while we might not really see Jackson Smollick this year, uh, a whole lot, if at all, uh, I think we'll see a decent bit of Bo Perbula, um, in those, you know, whether it's, whether it's sub packages or garbage time or whatever, you want to get Drew settled, you want to give him ample reps, but you'd also don't want to get him hurt. You want to get Bo ready as well. So it's just something to monitor over, over the next few weeks. And, uh, among many other things on this team, because there's a lot of other position battles worth keeping an eye on as well. Yeah, I, I think you're right about uh, Bo, uh, 100% right. 
they have to know what they have in him. He has to be comfortable. He's going to have to play. I mean, the first two games, um, I, I, I have to I have to think that, you know, in the third quarter of both – well, <laughs> they played Delaware at home in week two. In the third quarter of the Western Union game, I know James isn't going to say anything. You know, it, it <clears throat> at home, prime time, it would be really surprising if if Penn State is 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 still in a tense battle with West Virginia with six minutes to go in the third quarter. Uh, but who knows? Anything can happen. But I mean, you have to you have to make sure Bo gets gets his feet wet in game conditions. And also, you know, Johnny, they have to have a plan for him in August. I mean, to get him comfortable. Um, you're, you're really getting two quarterbacks ready for the season because. You just have to look at Penn State quarterbacks uh, during the Franklin era. Uh, they came in different sh- uh, shapes and sizes. Um, Christian Hackenberg did not have the benefit of a great offensive line, and he got the crap kicked out of him. He he did in 14 and 15, and it got worse and worse. And then they had the running quarterbacks, whether it was Trace or even Tommy Stevens. And Sean Clifford, it's easy to forget that he's, you know, early in his career, he was a <laughs> – he was a really good dual threat quarterback. And I think he evolved more as a thrower who could hurt you with his legs. But when you just think about those three last quarterbacks, whether it's Trace, Tommy, or Sean, they all took some serious punishment and had to play through some things. And, you know, you, you think about Sean in the Auburn game, you think about Trace, you know, carrying 25 times for 175 yards in the Ohio state game. And his last year at Penn state, you could tell he was beat up, but, I know, I know that Drew is not that kind of quarterback, but he is going to have to deal with some punishment uh, being the, the, the uh, you know, they're going to be coming after him. They're going to, it's probably going to be a little bit easier to find, but yeah, that's one thing he's going to have to learn <clears throat> to deal with. And that's something that, you know, um, you really can't deal with it until you, until it actually, you actually experience it. And that's going to be, I think, some things I'm going to be looking for, uh, assuming it's Drew, like how, how does he react to his first really big hit and he shakes it off and he's kind of, kind of slow coming off the field. It's going to happen. Curious to see how that's going to play out. But um, the good news for Drew is, and and Michael Robinson alluded to it at big 10 media days is they, you know, if their offensive line is as good as they think it is, they're not going to, I don't know that they're going to have to ask Drew to really win a lot of games. I mean, they have, they have the, they have the pieces, they have the running backs, they have the tight ends. I think the wideout room, even though, you know, it's 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 certainly talented. It's just a little bit inexperienced, but that's the nature of the position. I mean, good receivers in college football are not going to stick around very long. So you're it, invariably you're counting on a first or a second year wide receiver to step up almost every year. So that's part of it. But James has always talked about four minute offenses, and they've never really been great at that. They were good at it in 2019 a little bit, um, but even when they had Barkley, he was a big play guy. Like then you know, and, and they didn't really have. They didn't really have a, 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 a you know, third and two. It, it, there was no guarantee they were going to convert that. I just think that this team in short yardage with Katron and Nick and, the, and you know, and that T formation, they can extend drives. They can protect Drew. They can protect leads. They could keep their defense fresh. And I, I do think what Michael said is true. Um, if they're going to be good, it doesn't necessarily mean Drew having a huge year statistically. Yeah, I agree with that. And you know, for everything you already mentioned, you know, with Nick, with Katron uh, in the backfield, even maybe a little sprinkle of Trey Potts in there. Yeah. But you've got an offensive line anchored by one of the best, if not the best tackle uh, in the country in Olu. Uh, you've also got an interior line with a lot of experience. I mentioned Hunter at center, but <laughs> Sal Wormley, Landon Tegwall, as long as he stays healthy at guard, a lot of confidence in what Van Guyon could do. Uh, in a rotational role um, at right tackle, there's that battle that's still ongoing and probably will bleed into the season between Caden Wallace and Drew Shelton. Um, but something that I kind of go back and lean on from what Phil Troutwine, the offensive line coach, said in June uh, when talking about Javen Williams, actually, yeah. uh, the, you know, the understudy right now to Olu at left tackle, is that – they're going to want to rotate this offensive line, these these linemen, these blockers, as much as they can, uh, without obviously like you know giving up you know plays or hurting themselves in games. Right. Um, because Phil said, you know, this is if this season is what we want it to be, you know, if they're playing 15 games and going to the Big Ten title and going to the national championship and and these mm-hmm. kind of hopes and aspirations that this team has, 
they're going to need to keep their offensive linemen healthy and and rotate them and fresh. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that goes for the running backs as well. Um, that goes even for the tight ends as well. When you look at their responsibilities as blockers with, you know, maybe Khalil Dinkins steps up as that number three tight end. Uh, maybe Andrew Rappel, yeah, gets some run. Uh, whether or not he burns his red shirt, we'll have to wait and see as a freshman. Um, and then the question at wide receiver. And one thing that, you know, some schools do, sometimes schools will like nominate players for these watch lists. Sometimes the watch list just put together themselves, but I'm not exactly sure how Penn State does it. But it was interesting to see the other day, I think it was yesterday, we're recording this Tuesday morning, yep. that Dante Cephas was named to uh, the Bolitnikoff Award watch list. And so that could just be a little like, yeah, hey, maybe Penn State's pretty con- – I mean, they have every right to be confident. Uh, in him as a target and as a guy who could potentially step up as a number one for them, given what he did already at Kent State. Now yeah. there's going to be some, still some settling in time, some <clears throat> acclimation time, you know, getting used to Big Ten play as opposed to what he was dealing with in the MAC. But, you know, him plus Keandre plus Harrison Wallace, who I think is is due for a really big year. Um, and then if Amari Evans can step up. Still plenty of questions in that group. But I think that I, I, you know, there, there's reason for optimism on this offense. There's reason for optimism on this defense. And you had mentioned Deny and Adisa and Chop, um, which mitigates an injury or, you know, uh, like Smith Vilbert, yeah. which I know you mentioned, we kind of glossed over a little bit. Unfortunate for him. Yeah. Obviously, you know, he, he missed uh, the entire regular season last year, played in the Rose Bowl, but. Uh, we didn't get a, a, a reason as to why he necessarily missed last season, but a season-ending injury this year, um, you know, they, they're pretty set at the end, though, between those three guys I just mentioned, plus uh, Amin Vanover and even Zariah Fisher, uh, who yeah. came back from his injury last season and played towards the tail end. I think they're confident in what he could do in a rotational role as well. And so this team just screams depth. You know, it stems from last year, playing as many young guys as they did, playing as many guys, period, uh, as they did. And I think that's really going to pay dividends for them this season on both sides of the ball. Yeah. Johnny, before we close out this uh, blue white breakdown, uh, Johnny and I will be doing it for you all throughout <clears throat> August camp and into the season. Dave Jones will be along a little bit later this month. I know some fans are always interested to hear what, <clears throat> excuse me, he has to say, I, I, I thought maybe we would do this. It's August. Have a little fun with it. Johnny, between you and I, if, you can come up with your choices. I'll come up with mine. If you had to pick just based on what you saw, you know, during media day and whether it's an early look at some of the practices, if you had to pick five, uh, at all freaks, all physical freaks uh, team at Penn State and you had five picks, or maybe you don't have five picks, but if you have three or four guys that you just look at them and you saw them on the practice field, you saw them at media day and you're like, Jesus. Uh, I had a couple of guys on my list. Curious to see <clears throat> who's going to be on your list. I think let's we can get an obvious one out of the way and say Abdul Carter is is going to make that list. But there there are some specimens uh, on this team, and they're all they're all in in top condition. But some just to me just just you know stood out, and they. They are they they looked apart, but they, I think they've also been very productive, um, whether it's early in their careers or if they're veterans. But if you had to come up with a list of maybe the the freakiest of the freaks in terms of physical imposing physical skill set, who who's going to make the cut for you? Uh, so if we're picking five, I think my one, two, three, four, and five is Denai Dennis. Yeah, he's done. He's I think <clears throat> it's one and one a between Abdul. And deny, but Joe Herman had a picture of deny. The guy is, you know, Olu talked in the spring about how he's li- he was lifting weights, living in the weight room, and it sure looks like it sure looks like he has done that. Um, he is almost 260 pounds right now, and James James couldn't hide his excitement during the spring about you know just how rough it was for the young tight ends to try and deal with him. And no, I know it was only the blue white game, but I didn't see an offensive tackle come close to handling him one-on-one. He was just unstoppable. And I don't, I don't, I think that's going to continue. I feel sorry. Uh, you know, if he's not starting and he's coming into the game and he's got fresh legs in the second half of the game, I kind of feel sorry for some, for some offensive tackles that Penn State's going to face because this guy, 
Adisa, Adisa, and you know Chop. You know Adisa could be a very high first uh, high pick in the draft. Chop is is there right now if he just continues to develop. I think I think Deny is by the end of the year he's going to be right there with him, if not better. And he looks he looks like he is in peak condition to do some damage. He definitely does. Um, another one uh, because yeah, I say in jest that Deny was my one through five. There's yep. some other guys. Uh, yeah. I mentioned Van Gaion earlier in the pod. Sure. I mean, he's every bit of six foot four, 350. He might be 360. Uh, he might be 365. Um, if you told me any number north of 350, I would believe yeah. you because he, he's just a monster. Um, and I do think that, you know, Troutline and, and the staff are confident in, you know, especially because, because Van Gogh, when he was in, you know, I just remember that, the, the one hole he opened uh, just mauling his guy in the Minnesota game when he yeah. was playing right, right guard. Yep. And I know that they're confident in Sal Wormley and he's a veteran on this team and really well respected within the locker room. But uh, if you told me that by mid season, Venga is cutting into his reps, I wouldn't be surprised uh, <clears> just because of the, the physical nature that he plays. He just has to find a little bit more consistency as most young players do. Um, so that's one Khalil Dinkins is another. Uh, I just think that he his, his everything that he projects, every, just the way you look at him, you're just like, okay, yeah, you, you're you're on a fast track here to some playing time, um, and yeah, I mean Abdul's an easy one. I think Tony Rojas could get there. Uh, one one really under the radar guy. Uh, Don't steal my guy. Don't do it. Don't do it. I know you're going to do it, but go ahead. Is, is it a is it a former JUCO transfer, a defensive tackle? It is it? not. It's not. But okay, yeah. I know. Uh, I like the pick, though. I like where you're Jordan, going. Jordan Vandenberg. If you just looked at, you know, there was a video yeah. uh, over the summer of of him yeah. missing, and it, it was just like, how how is he doing? Like, it was a 615 pound squat, 380 pound power clean, and he did the power clean with with one arm, and <laughs> it's like it's one of those again where he has to find consistency in translating the strength, the, the, the brute strength that he has onto the field. And, uh, you know, the D tackle room could absolutely use it. Um, yeah. You know, Hakeem Beeman, I think is, yeah. uh, you know, with his added weight, um, will impress, you know, cause I, Izzard, Ellie's, you know, that, that group, you know, Zane Durant, but I just feel like, uh, Vandenberg is really, you know, ha- has an opportunity uh, to establish <clears throat> himself as, as a run first, you know, helper, a, a lane clogger, a guy that is going to yeah. cause problems for a run first offense. And it's just a matter of translating that for him. He's got the strength. He's got the build for it. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think it's easy to overlook this player, but he's added some great weight and he's always been one of the freakiest players. Curtis Jacobs looks tremendous to me. Um, he is moving very well with added weight. I'm excited to see what he can do with the added strength. And the guy that um, <clears throat> I was almost going to say he plays a different position, but he, 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 and he's not as big, but he's got a similar physique uh, to deny is Kevin Winston Jr. That safety, holy mackerel. He looks like, you know, he's six, two, two, you know, two ten, two Oh five, but he is just a, he, he's just a long fluid looking guy that, um, you know, he's a guy that looks like, He's got the he's got the 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 ball skills to play the to, you know to to play coverage really well, but he's also big like big almost outside linebacker big to be a thumper if they ask him to do that. He looks to me if you look at the safety room, he looks to me he look if you if you just took the numbers away and just lined them all up and you said to some some NFL assistant who which guy looks like he's ready to play in the NFL. It would probably be him just physically looks the part. I thought he had a great spring, but yeah, he's another guy I think that would be on my list. That's why I was saying at the beginning, it, it, it's easy to, to kind of on a media day to find somebody to talk to on this Penn state team. Cause they all look like they're, they, they all look, James is right about the two deep and maybe the three deep. This is not your typical Penn state team. This, the, the, the second team guys look like can, they can give the first team guys all they want. Bookmark this, Bob, and, and Penn State fans. There's going to be a hit that KJ Winston has. It's going to be some some poor yeah. wide receiver coming over the middle early in the season, whether it's West Virginia, uh, God bless him if it's a Delaware wide receiver, oh. or, or even Illinois. Yeah. There's going to be some poor wide receiver coming over the middle, and KJ Winston's going to lay him out. And it's going to be yeah. one of those hits that makes the highlight reel for the yeah. season. And it's, I like it's, the it's going to happen. 
Yep. I agree. Johnny, great chatting with you. We have, I think, <clears throat> a Penn State availability coming up a little later this week. There's going to be an open practice, Penn State fans, on Saturday at 7 o'clock at night. There's details on the Penn State Go PSU Sports uh, website. If you guys live close to Penn State, I think it's an opportunity for you to uh, to go up there and watch them. I don't know how much they're going to do, but keep that on your radar. Johnny, we'll be going to be busy. It's going to be a quick August. It's warm out, but media day is in the books, and we're just going to see if Penn State can stay healthy in the next couple of weeks because this is a, a fascinating team to watch, I think. If they are healthy uh, and they get through their first two games and get go to Illinois, that's a game I'm, I'm really excited to watch that game. 